So the thing that's definitely happening in your world, you're not challenging yourselves to figure out other ways to do content. People get into ruts. They have something that works and they do it for the next seven years. Like you have to try different shit. Like again, the thing I'm most proud of and I want you all to go look at my last 100 posts on Instagram. We're trying all sorts of shit. I'm saying the same shit for 20 years. But if you find different creative ways and you understand, you can find that pay dirt. Attention is the number one asset. Hello, hello, hello. Ready to rock and roll. I think I'm sure the team's prepped you for this, but you know, I think we've done this long enough to know that you know, what I encourage you to do is like to go as deep as possible to your actual question. Uh, it's cool that other people get value from it, but don't shy away from the most nerdy, nerdy detail because that's what this portion's about. So feel free and it's nice to be with all of you. How do we not be commoditized against our peers? Um, you know, if you look at the on the field product of, you know, a competitor of the adult sports, you know, world over in New Jersey, it's very similar. Um, so often the first time we're compared to our competitor, like, hey, how come they're hundred dollars cheaper or you know, this or that. Why are they hundred dollars cheaper? Um <clears throat> That most people are just doing it not to run a business and just kind of as a passion project, side hustle, and not really into make money. They usually have like side work or other work to do. But as you can imagine, the consumer doesn't care about that. Oh, absolutely. So, from a consumer standpoint, what? So that, how do you answer that? Yeah. So, well, to answer the question to them, it's we're more organized. We have a website. We have back end uh, coordination of schedules and all this other kind of stuff. Some people, as you can imagine, are like, take a picture of the Google Sheet, email it out, or text it out, or whatever, so. So for, offer... first, first you feel like you will, if they value their time, you can sell it back to them, yes? They're right, like, yeah. yeah, so I think, I, I always think time is like the ultimate thing to sell. Mm -hmm. Like there's people in here who've literally ordered from Postmates a $4 candy bar and paid $27 in shipping just so they didn't have to go downstairs and, in New York City to the local bodega and pick it up. So you do answer that by saying we save you time because of the tech stack or don't you? Mm. That's a question to y'all. Um. Because I think I'm empathetic that you may not realize how big of a deal that is and it might seem like not the biggest thing to sell on yeah. and I would argue it's definitely something you should sell on. And in fact, I would try to like really think about it and get into like text notifications and other things because I think it's, I always, one thing I really enjoy in these things, I really pay attention, right? So you talk, I hear something, I say, why is it $100 more? You say, well, it's a side hobby for them. They're not writing the same P&L. I'm like, that's good businessman stuff, but I don't give a fuck if I'm Johnny about your problems. I'm trying to save 100 bucks. If you can then communicate what the value props are, that will become really important because nobody's commoditized. It's a really funny thought. Like everyone's commoditized and no one's commoditized. Like everything we're wearing right now is actually commoditized. Yet we chose to pay more for many different reasons. Um, and, and everything else, I think the question becomes, can you articulate why you're a better option? Like every single person in here is looking to articulate the value proposition in a better way so that they get more people to decide yes them. So I think, you know, I think, keep going. Besides that, is there other things that you can speak to? In terms of? The value? Um, because by the way, it's okay to go as blank as we think we run a better ship yeah. and it's, it's worth more. Yeah. And then if they say why, you say, like our people are better, you know, we do think we're saving you time and you're all busy. Because the cool thing is the people you're talking to, you know, are, you know, it obviously runs the gamut, but one of the great things about being in the tri-state area is everyone's busy. Yeah. Like inherently, it's in the DNA <laughs> and the fabric. You know, That's it's just in the energy, right? Yeah. Um, but I think right off the bat, for everybody, and definitely for you, is like, you, you've got to be okay with saying our people are better and thus. And for someone like me, I'd be like, well, yeah, I want better refs or I want better, you know, like yep. when I walk into the, like, I, I don't know every detail yet, but like that. No, you're there. I mean, you know, we have, we, we staff site managers on the field, you know, we're trying to get, we're coaching and training them to be more personable, get to know the captains on a first name basis, be able to communicate on the field. Um, we do a lot of uh, showing off the players in terms of MVP pictures for every game, again, post on social. Uh, videographer. How often is this coming up? The price mm -hmm. question? Um, 
Not that often, but I want to increase the price, but like bring the value in, in, the, same, in yeah. the same way, you know? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, it's funny, I grew up in a liquor store called Shoppers Discount Liquors. Price was what my dad traded on. <laughs> And I got ingrained in that. And, and, and ironically, even before I went to my dad's liquor store, my baseball card business was based on price. Mm. I would literally walk the show in the eighth grade as everyone was setting up, memorize all the prices of like the key 50 cards that everybody gave a fuck about at the moment and go back and reprice them cheaper. Like it was such an easy thing to understand on price. And obviously over the last, you know, since that kid, over the last 40 years, I understand like there's many different variables one can play on. And you know, like now everybody wants to play at the 1% of the 1% because that's real good business when you don't play in price. But I, I like where your head's at. And I would tell you, and for everyone who's listening as well, whether it's Scott's Protein Balls or anybody else in between, always challenge you, yourself of why someone would pay for this at this price. Is like, like, I don't know if there's a day that I go by that I don't think about that. And I think most people don't think about it at all. And I think there's something in there. So I love that that's where your head's at. And that's what leads to innovation of value. Like all of a sudden, here's a good example. The amount of people that want to be sports broadcasters that are on social media is like a billion. Just adding a live stream component to every game that's aired on Twitch to four people, but has a wannabe sportscaster actually broadcast the game, I would pay for our background, I would pay for that, I'd pay a thousand dollars for that. At dinner last night we were talking about like, what could we make, could we wreck some style, <coughs> follow one of the teams from the league? Yeah, I mean those are really fun, like <laughs> clever ideas. Um, I think that's cool. I think of that as like the sprinkles yeah. to the Sunday and the Sunday has to be something like, we broadcast your games and commentate them. <laughs> What's cool is the cost is nothing. You've got Twitch, you've got all these live streams and Again, Tri-State Area has advantages and disadvantages. There's just like literally a thousand people who would work for nothing to be able to call the game with the hope that they get discovered. <laughs> that's why I like challenging yourself of like what's in it for them. This, that's what I think a lot about. Like notice the example I gave you. Twitch is free. It's not like, by the way, do you know why I used YouTube within weeks of it being available? Because three years earlier I tried to do Wine Library TV and asked my tech team and they said it was gonna cost $50,000 a week because streaming bandwidth cost in 2003 <laughs> were literally like $50,000 if like 10 people watched three minutes. And then you know, three years later YouTube was, like it literally took me like 20 minutes to be like, no, no, it's free, like it's free, like I'll post it and YouTube's not gonna send me a bill. It's funny to think about those things. So I think you're on a good path. Keep Try to add four more bells and whistles that aren't your staff is nicer. Those are right. Yeah, yeah. But you're gonna need like the thing right, on the, yeah, yeah. exactly. The menu of like, oh, 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 of course, 150 more. Yeah, yeah. Got it? Yeah. By the way, you could go local college that has a sports broadcasting thing because I assume there'll be content at scale, right? There's multiple leagues going on it all the time. And again, oh, you, yeah, could, you yeah. could also create tiers. Yeah. So one of the ways you could raise your prices, whatever imaginary price you had, for increase, you might not do it for everyone. You may have a double that price for the sportscast broadcasting way. You could still net out at the same top line revenue and have real justification of why more. Yeah, yeah. And I just came up with one idea in two seconds that I think would work. I think you keep building on that. Yeah, for sure. Do you keep hardcore stats? Uh, For basketball, yeah. Yeah, I mean I- I used to do it across the board, but it just got sloppy and like, 15% 15% aside from basketball, we're looking at it, so it was just like not worth this week. Yeah, I think with that gets me immediately into like really actually producing meaningful actual trading cards for everyone in the league with actual stats on it. There's just like, you just keep looking, if you can just, you're just trying to arb. Notice how he picked up on like, oh, there's no risk. Like, I'm always thinking of like cost of goods against perceived value. Yeah, yeah. Right? Right, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that you started there and I would tell you that that is a good cadence forever. I mean, there's a million ways to do this. Food and beverage. Food and beverage could be a reason. Hmm. Like, where are you like physically? Uh, anywhere from Weehawken to Wayne to Whippany. That whole area kind of thing? A lot, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. lot of W's there. Um, uh, I, really think that, I really think that the restaurant sitch in Bergen and Passaic County also is like an opportunity. Hmm. Maybe you start using your business as a platform for discovery of food. Hmm. So like you reach out to all 7,000 restaurants that are on 80 and, <laughs> and 10 and say, hey, we have this, we have captive audience, high net worth individuals that are paying for this. 
would you like to showcase, you know, another reason is like our food and beverage program is better. Another, notice what I did there, low cost, I'm using my platform as a marketing engine so I can arb the cost of goods because I'm not gonna pay for that food, but there's perceived value on the other end of people there. And they should, yeah, show up at the field. Yeah, you know, like my number one thing, especially with buddies that I play with is like, oh, we could eat afterwards and shoot the shit and talk shit about the game and just continuous stuff like that. Yeah. What else? Um, tough one. Um, growth in new markets. So uh, we came into New York City last year uh, stumbled a little bit just in terms of bandwidth from running in New Jersey, coming to New York. We didn't have any boots on the ground in, in New York. Why'd you come to New York? Uh, the lore of it? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Because then, you know, we take a step back and we're like, what the hell? Like, yeah. We're not even in Hoboken. You just, took, like, you just ate every word out of my mouth. Like, yeah. knowing the size and scale of the New Jersey market and knowing the supply and demand of opportunity, like, when I think about you going to Livings, like the Livingston Short Hills Milburn area and doing it there versus playing here, it's like, you have any, people do this all the time in business. Yeah. Like they get excited about expansion for the sake of expansion. Like the thesis, the, the ideology, the, the concept, more than like the actual business reality. Like this business is way better executed in New Jersey and Connecticut and Rhode Island and all those places. Manhattan just has so much pull and cogs and competitiveness, you know? Um, yes. But, ironically, go. cogs are very, very low for it, a field space. Yep. And that's like one of our top things aside from Co- uh, Hitting cogs, right, fair, fair. Got it, got it. Got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm using my own slang. You're sure. right more than I am. <coughs> Energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your time is the number one cog. Yeah, and especially living across there, you know, what? Crossing we take. It just, in I'm in always and all that. sad. I do it plenty too, which is, this is, I think I'm giving therapy to myself. When you haven't fully squeezed the shit out of this grapefruit, what the fuck are you grabbing that orange for? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's still a lot of fucking juice here. Yeah, yeah totally. I'm selling my stopwatch because I am going to be selfish. This is a, this Don't worry, James, is, uh, I trust him more than anything. But <laughs> we can double it up, go ahead. This, this, this is a big day for me because I worked hard to get back to this point. Um, just to give you some context. Well, first of all, I want to say the reason I'm here, and you're always about context and relevance. I listen to your, I listen to the, the Gary Vee stuff that you repost through my Spotify when I do cardio. I think it was on the first of the month. That I, we of were, this month? Uh, maybe last month. October. We run an agency. And you mentioned something about like, you know, maybe you lost a big client today. And you know, right at the end of the month, oftentimes agencies yeah, yeah. turn over. That was super relevant. Then you guys started talking about Sasha Group and 4Ds. And yeah. my assistant kind of looked it up and we booked. So It's just, amazing. Thank just, you for that yeah. feedback. Um, but just uh, here's my Eric Godfrey moment. Okay, Eric Godfrey is the kid I met outside when I was seven and he's, when I literally moved to Addison, New Jersey and they were throwing a Nerf football and he said, who do you like in football? And I said, I was, I was just in America for a little while at this point. He's like, well, you're a Jets fan and that's literally how I became a Jets fan. <laughs> and it's like the cornerstone of my interest in life. Yeah, so here's my Gary V, Gary v uh, Eric Godfrey moment. Uh, I went to Babson <clears throat> College was one of the pioneers of premium SMS, made a shitload of money, got on t- invited to some boat. I'm on my way to the casino to, to roll craps with the founder of Groupon and Living Social. And my friend Ryan Sessler goes, I'm going to see Gary Vaynerchuk, you gotta come with me. You weren't Gary V then, you were Gary <laughs> And I said, who? Because I was into Tim Ferriss, because I was- Yeah, I loved him, yeah. And Ryan Sessler, who's just a, a, an as- acquaintance of mine, goes, Andy, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk. And I walk in there, you came out, you were, I guess you were 35 at the time, you looked like you were 16. You're wearing a shitty pair of cargo shorts, like a t-shirt. <laughs> that sounds exactly um, right. You did the best keynote speech I'd ever heard in my life. Gary comes out on stage and goes, I'm the most ruthless entrepreneur you've ever met, does his whole spiel, I used to pick those, and he looks right at Russell Simmons and goes, fuck you, Russell Simmons. <laughs> I, I did, I did, I did, I remember. In that moment, I've been the, I've been, I've been, I've been all in since, anyway. And, and By I, the way, to give you context so you don't think I'm a complete <laughs> jerk off, what was, and he's painting a very clear picture, what was happening was everyone, here was my point. I'm very good at, at, I'm a good public speaker, but I'm very good if I have a lot of context. So what was good about this boat was I was speaking about a day and a half in. All I do is watch. So I was watching how everybody was rolling. And what I noticed was, right, you're probably remembering more now even, like I couldn't believe how, First of all, this was already a bougie fucking thing. 
why do you need to look at everyone's fucking name tag before you decide how important they are? And this was at the height of like Google and like, and I was just, it was just very obvious to me that like what people were doing and I was like, and I'm so into like loving people like blindly. It's just so foreign to the way I see the world, especially because everyone's on a journey, which was the point of like, you don't get it. I'm going to be the most important guy here, but you don't know that yet. And, and what my point was, was like, stop pegging everyone. Let's spend the back half of this boat just being nice to everyone. You don't know who you're gonna meet. One thing you did on that trip too, we got in a, like a semi-circle. It started with like three of us, then it was six. I think by the end, maybe 10 people. You stayed up all night just talking to people. I went to bed at two in the morning, but I watched you walk off that boat like going like this, and I was like, what the fuck was the ROI in that guy doing that? But, I mean, it's just amazing. It's cool, man, I'm very humbled, thank you. Yeah, it's Go ahead. Um, so anyway, it's been a long journey for me. I got, I, I got into some legal issues in that premium SMS space. It took me out of the game for six years. Wow. I started working with a, with a Harvard neuroscientist uh, we were trying to sell a, a military grade uh, mental protocol to DARPA, which is the advanced research. Yep. No, it, yep. Wasn't making any money doing it, but it dialed me the fuck in. When I got out of that kind of six years of kind of going through legal help, yep. and this guy, you know, he was doing brain mapping and all this stuff. I've been sober for seven years. I eat organic. I meditate. Love I do all it. this shit. He really dialed me in. And, but I was making three grand a month. Wasn't wasn't doing much. And all of a sudden, pandemic comes, and I'm the most calm clear-minded version of myself ever. Interesting. I'm sitting at my parents' home in Cape Cod. I get a call from a girl who's, who remembered me when I was this young, high-flying internet marketer. And they need your help. I've got $100 to my name. I'm some Jewish lady's nanny in LA doing her grocery shopping. I'm stressed out about getting coronavirus. So I yeah. only fans, but I can't figure it out. Yeah. So what the hell is that? I logged in. I said, oh, wow, you're trying to thirst drive. <laughs> right, yeah, really, yeah. No marketing logic. Yep. <clears throat> really robust in the sense that I can you know, sell, make these transactions, but it doesn't do a good job of taking a creator with a blindfold on and saying, do steps one, two, ten, and you're gonna make it back. Yeah, yeah. This girl had 50,000 followers on Instagram, no TikTok, no Twitch, no Twitter, no nothing, wasn't a creator. I shoved her out of the way, and I started to story tell with her content, made her a quarter of a million dollars in a month. She starts running around LA, starts telling all these right. Instagram people, yep. uh, hey, don't trust your business to nightclub promoters, and right. eat, you know, yeah, I get it. there's these guys in Boston. And it exploded, and it, what, what's happened is, the owners of that platform were Ukrainian and Russian guys. Um, they, they, now, they now use us basically when they've got larger celebrities like Denise Richards, Mia Khalifa, people like that, that they can see on the back end aren't quite taking advantage of their opportunity. They bring them to us. Here's, here's why I'm here. Built this company to a $100 million a year company without a brand and without, uh, without putting content on the internet. And it was all these kind of intellectual face-to-face -face Zooms where I would get on the you know, get on FaceTime with these content creators and really say like, hey, if you get a fan, when you attract an audience, you can make $5 off them or 5,000 off them, what's the difference? That's what we bring to the table, the analytics, the special sauce. Yep. Oh my God, I didn't know you existed, da da da. After about year three, I said, it's time to brand this thing. So we built our brand, Creators Inc. and went all in on that. We just had this big house party with Steve Aoki. We activated New York Fashion Week so all of our clients who don't just want to be OnlyFans creators could come and walk on a runway. We do stuff like that. Yep. Problem is, now that we've built this big fancy brand, they're not coming like they were when I just got on FaceTime with them and I was like, you know, what's quantitative analytics? Like, how? what's a wall post for? What's this for? What's that for? Is it a macro or micro thing, do you think? Because the, the space is more mature as well. Like, I think a lot of times people, <laughs> Remember when we lost the subway pitch and I was shocked? Were you here for that? We like we won like thirteen pitches in a row, and then like Subway said no, and I was like baffled. I was like, how is that possible? And what I didn't realize at the time was, uh oh, when we said social media in two thousand like ten and eleven, people were like, okay, like like my brother's laptop literally created the Pepsi and NHL and Campbell's Soup, like Facebook and Twitter. Like it was that early. Obviously as that ecosystem has evolved. That's why I'm asking you, do you think it's a macro or micro issue? No, it's a micro because... Uh, yeah, well, that's, then, then that's golden. If you believe that it's micro, you just go back to the number one thing that always works in business, which is, and it's, I can't believe the fact that your story touched on this. What was the ROI of that guy doing it? Scaling the unscalable always works. The cool part is, your story is so simple, right? Why don't you just go back and do that? Now, you may not want to, and that's awesome. That's okay. Because then you can have a diluted version of that. 
meaning you hire other people. Like nobody sells the way I sell my stuff. But if I was the only person doing that, then it would only be what it is. So I'm okay with the B and the C and the B minus and the A minus. I mean, you're thrilled when it's the A minus version of what you do. So all you'd have to do is replicate what you would do one on one with the Navy SEALs and the Green Beret. Not the general army that your 100 million is. You have to build a Navy SEALs or a Green Beret to be an A minus, B plus, hopefully B, no worse than B minus version of you doing it. And you're also allowed to go back and do it as often as you want to. There's an interesting variable. Go ahead. So one of the reasons I never just took the content of me, you know, pitching and selling and talking about quantitative. Well, that I understand. Why? Well, there's two ways that people think about that. One, they don't want to be out in front. Like that's just a human thing, which is very real. You're allowed or not allowed. And two, some people fear that they go too far in the details of it and people can replicate it. Yeah, and specifically in our case, what I didn't want to do was piss off the partners at at OnlyFans to be like, oh, when you're chatting with so-and-so, you're actually talking to us. So we were respecting that. Well, that, I I respect that. Because a lot of people people screw up and do that and then they just kind of get, you know, they they, they get mixed for that. (coughs) But we're kind of coming to the point now where, I mean, a lot of our, a lot of our marketing was trying to say things without saying things, and that's where I think we were. Yeah, that up. makes sense. That's where I mean, we were screwing. That go, I mean, that, that the number one business that sucks is that. At some level, you can get humongous, but it's going to weigh. The other thing is, just on a side note, the other thing you have to think about is just the business itself, because that work is going to get AI'd out for real, actually, for real, actually. Like, OF is going to do that, not let you do that. There's, I, you're right. I mean, but. In, in a lot of ways, I think we know where AI is gonna really help in this space versus like some of the parts where you would think that it might completely take over. Yeah, I would say this, and I, and I actually am a buyer of what you just said. Just do me a favor, because I, I want you to win. Never underestimate technology. It's always like, it's, back to the era we met, that next 10 years, I watched so many people say versions of that. CAC, ROA, you know this, I don't have to tell you. So just. And this one's such big technology. I would argue even the people that are deepest about it are potentially underestimating how gnarly this tech is. So I just want to make sure you keep that in mind. I think the number one thing that everyone should always be doing is putting themselves out of business before someone else does. I think you should go all in on assuming that truth and work backwards instead of whatever version of hope of what variation it becomes. Because I think that will lead you to innovate the next thing. I just want to tell you, there's a lot of Gary Vee in our business. So, for instance, like when I when I coach content creators, I'm talking about context, right? Yeah. Can I throw a left field at you thing at you? That's I'm just feeling so much. I have to say it. I highly recommend, and I think you will, based on everything I've heard. Please, when you leave here, please debate starting a consumer product. Yeah. So I'm in charge of growth, right? All these things are <laughs> we're looking at. Like we have a large roster. Every day, you see clients of ours, their content's getting ripped and turned into Snapchat original shows, right? So like, as we grow, we talked about this a little bit earlier too, right? Like, we're trying to figure out how to navigate. There's this concept of people gatekeeping a good service when they find it in our industry, right? Like, of course. As we've now started posting content, <coughs> we're like, how do we navigate going from top tier service that's behind the scenes to now kind of Walmart distribution in terms of media? and kind of navigating that content chain? I think A, I think that's right. B, I'm talking about starting a cereal. Yeah. No, we, or like a handkerchief. Uh, oh, by the way, we have to show you cereal creators because on one of your things you talked about like eating cereal on a podcast. Yeah, cereal entrepreneur. I, start, I, start, I started something called Cereal Creators Breakfast. Creator Cereal. cereal. Creator Cereal Cereal, uh, cereal <laughs> Breakfast for Cereal, cereal Creators. <laughs> Anyhow, last thing I want to plant in your head just so Please. you know, um, in case you ever have anything to throw Please. In. Um, out of nowhere, we've ended up with clients like Denise Richards, yep. like uh, Iggy Azalea, like, you know, these types well, of Well, not out of nowhere. It sounds like you're great at your craft and the platform benefits for you making people <laughs> that should be winning win. So much I would argue it's the least so, out of nowhere so, thing. So much so that... Uh, agencies like UTA looked at buying us because Makes they were sense. afraid Emily Bradikowski was going to come to us, make 400 grand a month on OnlyFans, and then we'd say, we'll do your brand deals for free. We'll They're right. Emails, right. Your higher value. Um, and I just kind of wanted to, uh, obviously, like you've been in the service business. For yeah, yeah. I'll give that some thought. Yeah, cool. Send me an email after this. I'll keep it, I'll, I know where to put it.
One other selfish question I have is yep. like you were talking about Twitch for them. We're yep. very tapped into culture. Like we have kids that are some of the bigger IRL streamers. Yep. Like St uh, Kick or Twitch. Like where do you see that evolving? Do you see it? I think it's a. Beyond Jack Doherty, any of those. Kids I mean, all, yeah, I get it. All of it is going to end up going to the blockchain because even. All of those exist because they're all scared to get banned for canceling on something. So you have these, we won't ban you until that becomes the, it's always, right. there's centralization and decentralization, right? This is why people are grossly underestimating the blockchain. In the geopolitics that the world is in, in the media landscape that we live in, there is an inevitable outcome of an and to the world we live in now. It's not like a decentralized social network or streaming service is gonna put out of business Twitch or Facebook of the day in five years, but both will exist. And the best, which is the game you're playing in, the best will all gravitate to decentralization once they extract attention from centralization. <laughs> you know this, all the creators are like, yo, fuck, Vine. I remember when the Vine guys and girls went to Vine to go yell at them, and I was like, tell me how that works out. <laughs> And I also tried to remind them that they were fucking babysitters and working at Starbucks until the attention that sat on Vine came to them. So how, that's how I think they'll work out. Are you streaming out. it all on Twitch? Or... My, I'll, I'm gonna go around because I don't want James to get mad at me. The an quick answer is <laughs> I'm not because I don't think people understand that I work 24 hours a day. Yeah. I'm one of the most prolific content creators but I allocate zero minutes a day to content creation I wish I could. I want to tell you the only reason I asked that yeah. is because what we've noticed in our space. The, oh, I get it, trust me. The problem is I'm inclined, if it was old wine library days, all of it. Because I'm sitting with sensitive information that is that I can get, that I, I just have, you'd be stunned how little I could. People who are crushing it, all, all they really have versus the people who aren't is good spatial awareness with them and their. I couldn't agree them. more. They're just doing a if, uh, man, I so I so see it. I get it. Trust me, I've been thinking about it a lot. Ustream ended up being a huge factor for me back in the, those days. Not just Twitter and Facebook. The early streaming stuff. All right, let me keep going. Uh, yeah, What's going on, Vancouver? Yeah, you. Uh, well, your first book was Crush It. You actually <laughs> talked about a realtor that started on YouTube, started filming himself in his car. That realtor is Ian Watt. Yep, I remember. Uh, who I actually consider somewhat of a friend. That's awesome. And so I kind of ended up just following that blueprint. Yeah. And um, ended up building a very good personal brand in the awesome. real estate space. Um, you know, like, big, you know, World Beyond Bloomberg interviewing, you know, CBC News. But I guess the issue that I'm having, or I'm here as a personal brand, trying to figure out sort of where my next move or where do I pivot, but. The residential real estate space, I find, is very hard to scale. And so I'm like, it's, it's a shit business to scale. And so I'm like... Most are. Yeah. And so I think I'm just looking ahead as, you know, I've been doing it now for 10 years. I mean, it's still a young guy. And I'm like, I've now started this podcast. It's called The Looney Hour. And uh, What's that about? So it's, it's myself. I look at it from the real estate space. Cause, you know, yep. Of course. People, Expertise. Yeah. Space. Yep. And I've partnered up with the guy that uh, runs portfolios. He's like a macro, macro investor. Basically, he runs uh, client portfolios. He's a money manager. He's a money manager. Yep, understood. Yeah. And then uh, the other guy was uh, worked for a hedge fund. He was, Love it. So you guys shoot it. Yeah. So the, we basically Love it. we literally just shoot the shit. How old are you? Uh, Thirty-two. Yeah, I mean this is perfect for me to answer. So from you know from from thirty from thirty to thirty-four, you know when I was Gary Vaynerchuk. I was the wine guy, just like you're the real estate guy in Vancouver. I decided to start making content about other things. As a personal brand who's built something, you gotta understand back to what he, he was just talking about. It's not just your pretty eyes, like you have other communication capabilities, charismas, so you could actually deploy that to anything else that you can speak to. I decided to go very macro and go into overall communication and then that led me to like, the insights of like how every humans, I went through a really weird period where I was like, I'm literally telling everybody what to do. I'm like, do this on Facebook. And I'm like, no one's doing it. And that led me to like, oh, people are insecure. People are like, people do things, like all the shit I talk about. But I could have went into like, I thought about it, sports. Like I'd be McAfee. That's why Pat and I are friends. Like I, whatever I was gonna do, it was gonna work. I just chose a certain lane. You know, I think what you need to do is decide what, if it's what's next, or I don't want to scale this, you, that blueprint continues to be true. The platforms change, the best practices within them change. But back to what these gentlemen were just talking about, 
whether it's streaming and spatial recognition, storytelling to the mundane, whether it's the next, I mean, the next TikTok is always one day away. It will happen. <coughs> you know, it could be seven years, it could be four years, but even back to like the nerd of all this, like the amount of money creators could be making on Snapchat because of the supply and demand of how much ad revenue is in there versus how many people create for it because everyone's fixated on TikTok and Instagram is enormous. And then OF goes from thirst traps to a broader market. and Patreon, there's just like a million things going on. I think your biggest debate at this young of an age is what is your favorite stuff? You can only win on passion or knowledge. Like, like, like someone like you, there's a lot of ways to win, but you, my gut, based on what I'm hearing, you're gonna win on either you love the fucking Canucks more than breathing, <laughs> or you really know something else well. I went with the well and passion, right? I went wine, business marketing. Um, you know, I think, I think you have a pretty clear, like what's co- also cool about the core real estate business is it's not like you have to retire. Yeah. The fact that you can start something around Pokemon, video games, table tennis, pool, whiskey, while still doing the real estate thing and then integrating it the way I do, because I'm all over the fucking place. You might get a fucking garage sale video for me or a Jets video or business or like, you know, like, I don't think people realize the renaissance man and woman thing is very real. Everyone's like, you gotta stay consistent. The bad advice, don't worry about it. I'm not not distracted. Um, uh, The bad advice that people go and be like, pick your niche and go, yes, but then once you have your steak, you can sell mashed potatoes, you could sell green beans. What do you think's gonna happen, brother? You think somebody in Vancouver is gonna see a video about you talking about whiskey and be like, oh, he also likes whiskey. I can't take him serious about real estate. People don't deploy common sense to this conversation. They talk academia. So where I'm seeing that crossover, just for an example, is is our Looney Hour show is now like, it's like the finance show in Canada. That's awesome. I'm into that. Full Canada. Like full Canada. That's awesome. So So it's doing well. The nice thing about that, right? Yeah. In Vancouver, you're, you're set to that geographical limit of constraints. Right? Yeah. So it's like your clientele is only going to be people that like, yeah, of course. buy and sell in Vancouver. Yep. It's like now we're opening up to Canada. Um, like we're literally interviewing like former prime minister yep. and stuff like that. Maybe. Yep. So, like, and it's lead gen for all of you, right? It's lead gen, yeah. But so for them too, they're very broad where you're narrow. Yeah, so I'm narrow, so I'm getting a lot of clients that are like, hey, I listen, I've been listening to the last 12 months. Have you, have you thought about building a a national brokerage? There's no, it's no, I don't think there's a lot of good money. And maybe it's because the Canadians is a little bit different. I think it's, a, it's I think the brokerage model is shit. I think it's actually dying. Okay. Where I do, where I think this is kind of leading is some of my question is, so my co-host, who's a money manager, uh, he wants to actually sort sort of help me, he wants me to help him scale his business and take you know, equity stake. Because basically what's happening I through that podcast, yep. unintentionally, is he's pulling in, like he's signing up two to three new clients a week. Not unintentionally. Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Intentionally. Which in that industry is, you know, most people will generate their business by becoming. All, all of this conversation for everyone is just brand is the best selling. Yeah. I always make fun of people who like don't believe in marketing and branding who are great salespeople. I'm a great salesman too. I'm like, cool, that's like, that's like when you're not good at marketing and sale and brand. Yeah. You like you guys are. It's not unintentional. You it's called worry. you built you built brand, which, yeah. which is why he has sales. You wouldn't worry necessarily about a crossover of like oh real estate and then sort of on the portfolio management side. He's like oh now he's kind of doing that thing. Well, let's that. play it out. I think when you hear it played out in conversation, you realize how silly it is. What do you think? Like what do you think is going to happen? People are like, what what, what happens? Yeah, like maybe last bit like oh I think he's not. You know, do I want to hire this guy because he's not fully dedicated to... Would you take my wine recommendation? 100%. That's the answer to the question. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, I guess they You've to... proven your worth in that other space. And the only reason why I look at that is because, like, so his competition, like, the whole industry in, in portfolio management is regulated by investment advisors that work for a big bank. Big bank says you cannot do social media at all. You want to send a tweet? Like, we need to get compliant. Oh, I'm very aware. There's plenty of versions of that all over the world. So I'm just looking at that and saying, I feel like this is a huge white space opportunity. Of course it is. Really have zero competition so the banks are unwilling to. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you'll lose your whole real estate empire in Vancouver because you've also started to play in the money management space. I mean, and that's assuming you go front facing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the thing. I think realistically I'd actually end up probably more behind the scenes. Exactly. Like, 
I'm not going to be the one that's physically managing someone's money. Correct. The guy that's building that business. Correct. So notice what I notice the clarity I just gave you on that. Yeah. Sounds like you're worrying about something that won't even manifest. Yeah. No, that's fair. I think it's like I think it's. But this goes back to like what we. Yeah, yeah. Like I think this is what we do. Yeah. Like I, I, if you just listen, like, well, they are not running real business. The consumer doesn't care. These are philosophical things we think. Stay on brand. Yeah. People don't care. What, what are we not willing to take Mark Wahlberg seriously as an actor because he was once Marky Mark? You know what I mean? Like we do this thing and I'm telling you it's all grounded in academia. It's not grounded in real market dynamics. The consumer has spoken on this issue. We will change our mind. And if you show me enough of you're this, you're this. Mike Bloomberg used to be a SaaS entrepreneur to me. Then he became a mayor. Like I don't know. Like you become what you are at a consistent pace. Both good, bad, and different. So I, I don't fear that. Especially it sounds like you have, like yours is really fun because it doesn't sound like you're even gonna confuse the market. Yeah, well I mean it's just nice to already have like the platforms and the brand is already built so it's obviously just trying to leverage that into like a more scalable business that I feel like, okay, where do I see myself? Yeah, 15, I think that makes sense. I think where you took it to a little bit of an interesting place, it sounds like you're fearing something that can't happen. Yeah, yeah, I, I think ultimately, like. Right, you're gonna be behind the scenes. It kind of feels like I'm asking for permission, but like. No, by the way, <laughs> by the way, the good news is that's a really good observation. I think we all do that. Yeah. I think we all like, this is why I believe in therapy the most. Sometimes you already know the answer, you just need to talk it through. Yeah, yeah. It's just a human trait for all of us. I guess my last question Please. quickly was, uh, so now again, if you had, I know you've got your podcast, yep. but if you had one recommendation uh, for scaling like my podcast, is there anything that you see as like a huge opportunity where it's like, oh, people like people that have an audio video podcast, they should totally be doing this. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I'm incredibly consistent about this. I, I believe that if everyone here, so I'm writing a new book called Day Trading Attention, right? I believe that we all have to day trade attention to maximize our upside. What that means is you need to pay attention to everything that is going on. So, that, let's just use screaming because I fully agree with these guys what's going on there. Like, I was one of the people early on that was like, hey, if you have a podcast, film it. And then post produce it and put it everywhere. Now that's incredibly <coughs> common practice. But I would also argue that you should stream it as well. Have four Twitch followers at first. Like, while you're doing the podcast. Now again, everybody has a different process. For me, everything's always worked because I'm happy to just like put it out there. Obviously, when you film something, you have the ability to post-produce it. If you're live, you're live. So like if you're just, if you go live and you're waiting for your guest, you might not want to do that live. <laughs> you know, like you got to think about what live means, but look, I think LinkedIn's organic reach is something everyone under leverages on this day as we all sit here today. I think people understand you can go viral on TikTok, though that's much harder than three years ago. I don't think people understand how consistently you can get organic reach that you didn't have the day before on LinkedIn, and I'm very bullish on it. I, and I think everybody here, whether you sell a protein ball or you're actually in the B2B business, LinkedIn is more Facebook 2015 than it is the LinkedIn that I think everyone defaults into thinking it is. So I would say anybody who's not distributing any of their content, everybody should be distributing content on LinkedIn. It's a really good psychology audience too. The human that's on LinkedIn, when they're consuming LinkedIn is a different version of themselves. Often very business transactional minded versus TikTok where you're just looking for escapism or or, you know, entertainment. I'm very, I would say that one really stands out for me. But then also just taking no assumptions. You need to film them and you need to post produce them. But you also have to be great at the post production. I know we'll touch on that. I don't know how much, have we touched on that yet? Or is that a back app? Have we done sock <laughs> stuff a little bit? Good, you know, so like this stuff, like the world works on storytelling. First of all, thanks. We, uh, we kind of built uh, Studio McGee on the heels of like, uh, thank you, Connie and Jeff, 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 so. Thank you, bud. Um, that's good, so, so since then, yeah, over nine years, we've kind of grown to be, uh, kind of a collection of businesses that are like over $100 million uh, annually, we have about 200 people on our team. Um, we primarily grew with Instagram, so we like, we started um, because we got on there and we're kind of un- pulling back the curtain on like high-end design, kind of make it more um, kind of like approachable and be able to answer a bunch of questions. So we've basically grown primarily most of our business off organic content and it was just like telling the, growing the brand, brand above everything, 
telling that whole story um, was really successful with a lot of business. And I think now we're at a stage where um, we are adding in pay and we're trying to really measure the attribution. Like, and you're within, a, within an Instagram environment? Yeah, Instagram, we're on TikTok. Um, we've, we had a Netflix show for like four seasons. Oh, wow. Was, that ended last season. So I mean, when we first launched Netflix, we saw an incredible like lift and like kind of like what was the show about? Called Dream Home Makeover. Yeah. We just they took kind of what we did, distilled it down. We'd go in and like put over like a room. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, in the beginning, that must have been huge awareness. So you're just feeling a maturation standpoint right now. Yeah. Which and is why paid has entered. Yeah. And so Makes like, sense. You kind of like just seen this meme reversion in the home industry over the last like I say like year. Like there was a big bond, like a big big bond <laughs> during COVID. And then when people would kind of let all their house, they're like, hey, let's Of course, of course, of course. Huge bump in like services, businesses. And now it's kind of like, okay, where are we at? Who's, who's left? This is my father calling me every day. He's like, why are we not selling as much wine as we did during COVID? I'm like, dad, people are not at their home 24. Like, I'm sorry. Like, somebody went to a restaurant tonight and ordered a glass of wine. That came out of your pocket. He's like, you have to fix it. I'm like, gee. <laughs> Like thank you for the confidence, but I'm like I can't change the world. Yeah. So I think that's kind of what we're left is like okay, we can either right size business a little bit more, which we have. We like we trim. Makes sense. Um, like we really like looked at business operations like hardcore, went really efficient. But after having this kind of run, it's in your tummy to just want to continue to grow instead of be more efficient, right? I would yeah, of course. Doubled every year for the last yeah, of course. Four, it's four five years, so. here's the cool. It's really funny because thank you, economy and jab, 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 right hook. Day trading attention six months ago was called jab, 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 left hook. It's I'm literally rewriting the book because it's changed so much, and I'm ready for a 301 course instead of the 201 that that book was at the time. The cool part is organic is here. It's just that you're not good at TikTok. Organic is here. It's just that you haven't even committed to LinkedIn, and then thus can't be good at it. So couple things. One, you've won between Netflix and Instagram and that run on awareness leading to, to sales. That is still on the table for all of us. It's just a lot harder right now, right? That, that, that's all that's happened, but it's actually never been greater. It's like this weird thing. It's like there's always ebbs and flows. It's why I was so, and I know it sounds like a lot of you have had context on me for a long enough time. It's why I was so loud Pandemic was March 2020. It was why I was so loud, late 18, all of 19 about TikTok. The land grab of organic was better than anything Instagram ever had. But nobody moved because everyone was pot committed Instagram. So, couple things. One, let that little thing, because you'll always, clearly what you have resonates, you just need to arm attention versus value, like, to, right? Just make sure that every time there's another new thing, especially if I'm loud about it, because that means it already happened, I'm not guessing, to go triple hard. I remember I promised myself before TikTok, if I ever saw another YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Vine, that I was, that was it. I was gonna go into a cocoon. I wasn't even gonna run Vayner. I was gonna be one, cause I knew it. And sure enough, Musical.ly came, TikTok came. I saw it, I did great, but I fucking went like 20% hard. Cause I had other responsibilities. And boy, do I wish I went 100% hard because it may be a long time before we have as big of a moat of opportunity as TikTok 18, 19 was. Anyway, that's all to be said that when they get into brand formants later, like there's definitely a play, media's great. Like I think people get religious, especially when they're great at organic. Like I'll, I grew all this without media. I'm like, that's not a badge of honor. I'm like, if you're a media, right? <laughs> and I get why. I get why. It goes back to a lot of what we're talking about here, like the subconscious, but when you really break it down, but if you could spend media perfectly and it would grow your business, why wouldn't you? Like, you know, you get caught in these like ideologies. So I think A, don't demonize paid. Paid's scary because like it feels really hurtful when you like spend $100,000 and nothing happens. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> external agency, like, they try to take credit for a lot, right? So they're like, hey, I'm not like, contributing like 25% of your revenue. And you're like, bro, you just got here like two, like six weeks ago. A hundred percent. I always make fun of our team. I'm like, we, we, every time a business is doing well, you all say we did it, and every time it's not doing well, it's their fault. <laughs> I'm like, you hypocrites. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, no, I think you should build this internally. I think most, I, I, I say it all the time, to clients all the time, this is why I think Sasha Group and Vayner do well. I'm like, why would you hire us? It goes back to what I was saying earlier, the price. I'm always like, why would someone hire us? 
this what we're doing, we, like I really think about 4Ds a lot. I'm like, why? Like, we put this video out. Like, I'm like, I think about this shit constantly. Like, why, why, why? So anyway, couple things. For your business, couple really interesting things. I don't have the full answer on this, but I'm spending a lot of time on Pinterest personally right now. For your business, Pinterest is bananas. It's just that Pinterest has never found its moment of like what we're all looking for, like that true organic monster. But I would A, flirt with that a little bit. YouTube Shorts is very important for all of us because YouTube's the second biggest search engine in the world. And your business is very search oriented. Like when people go their journey, and obviously they're doing that more and more on social, but I think YouTube Shorts is a very big deal. These are the platforms that I think you have to get as good. You have to understand, you have to give yourself more credit for getting good at Instagram back in that era. I think a lot of times when people have organic pay dirt, they give the platform credit, not themselves. Now, some things come more natural to people than others. One of the biggest reasons people didn't jump into TikTok is it didn't feel natural to them. It's, by the way, it's a challenge for me because I don't create. TikTok, you have to really create. Like my post-production shit does not work on TikTok the same way. I just have no options. I'm doing too many other things. So I'm gonna have to take that L and be like a C minus at it. My wife hates it because she's become like the face of our business, right? Yes. And she's like, damn it, like all the TikToks that do really well is it's like me talking. <laughs> they wanna see me just talking. Yeah, I don't wanna get on every day. Now I'm getting old, we're like 39, we're gonna be 40 soon. Like, You're so young. Oh, but you were fine, you know? But. She's like, those just do really, those resonate. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, I think, I think that the game for you is to get paid and organic to work well on every platform to the best of your ability. And to back to the different ideas that I was talking about over here for, for ideas for business, I think the thing I'm most proud of, and I hope you've all felt this, is like when you go to my grid, it's like a potpourri of randomness. Everyone's so obsessed with their grid being on brand. It's just not how people consume. They're consuming content to content. So the thing that's definitely happening in your world, if your wife's like, fuck this shit, I don't wanna do this every day, you're not challenging yourselves to figure out other ways to do content. People get into ruts. They have something that works and they do it for the next seven years. Like you have to try different shit. Like again, the thing I'm most proud of, and I want you all to go look at my last 100 posts on Instagram. We're trying all sorts of shit pouring fucking milk into coffee to say be you. Like, I'm saying the same shit for 20 years, but like, but if you find different creative ways and you understand, you can find that pay dirt. So like, maybe it's just audio. Maybe the two of you should have dinner where you know you're recording the dinner and you like know you're recording it and it's all audio. And you just literally like talk about shit that you want like to get out there and that's your podcast. And maybe that's your creative pay dirt. Cause that would be like some shit that I would listen to if I gave a fuck about a couple. Just them having dinner. And like still literally. Two post carousels. What's, yep, still working. But like again, I'm already feeling the, you know, it's just date, that's why I'm calling it day trading attention. I'm trying to get people out of the rut of like, oh, this works. They think it works for like the next nine years. You gotta be in it. You've just, you've hit that place we all have hit. Fatigue of the style of the creative or the distribution of the creative. You gotta challenge yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Introducing new people. You know when a sitcom has a great run and it's getting a little tired, they bring in like the kid, like that fucking weird kid for you know, the Brady Bunch and even Leo DiCaprio I think was like the kid for Growing Pains, like, they're, you know, like to spice it up, like the Cosby Show I think had a kid, like every great sitcom when it gets tired introduces that new character with the hope, you know, like you may want to introduce a new character to your ecosystem. I think that's what we're just thinking about is like as we introduce new things, trying to measure that to like, yeah, that, that is worth, you know. You know what's funny? Like, you gotta make sure you have patience in that. It's funny, like always think about your purest self when you were winning and then realize after levels of success how you're no longer that person. Me holding on to 2005 Gary is probably my best business move because you weren't fucking ROI measuring in 2014 Instagram the way you are now. You've become mature, you've become corporate. You're looking for ROAS and CAC and LTV, acronyms you didn't even know what the fuck they meant eight years ago when it started popping off. 2005 Gary still runs this, as a matter of fact, you know this, you guys know this. 2005 Gary or 2011 Gary, if we're talking Vayner X terms, came back a couple years ago and, right? And it's been way better, right? 
because I, I wanted to learn what, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I started bringing in more of corporate agency DNA over like a five year period. And then I knew what it was and I was like, all right, I'll keep the 3% of this garbage <laughs> that I like and we're gonna go back to 97% me and boy, right? You'll, right? It's like, and across, forget about feelings, like the PL shows it and it's just real life. This whole content is, is you now. Yep. Yep. So, cool. themes that work, right? Yeah. That. Thanks. I'll, 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 end, I'll end here. Um, just external, like generating, like uh, let's see, taking advantage of like external media opportunities. Right? Yep. We have a bunch that come our way now versus just <clears throat> deciding to go in house with generating that. Is there a way that you like kind of evaluate that to make that call? Of, like, hey, like do your own show on YouTube and just press that. Because I think it's and. I think it's and. Now, if you're saying show. Like obviously an external production company. Like I think right now if you're off the air, which it sounds like you are, I do my own show immediately. So when the next production company comes and wants you to do something, you're like, yeah, but I'm keeping my show. And like, yeah, you can do that. We're gonna do a different version here. So that would be on my mind on strategy. Hey Gary. Hi. Started my consulting firm back in 2005 as an insourced, um, with an in-source embedded, embedded model for general market ad agencies. And so we would place consultants on site at a, ad agencies throughout New York. And that worked and we grew for about seven to maybe 10 years. And what would agencies hire you to oh, come sorry. in? Yeah, they please. They hired us to do, to manage, to develop and manage their supplier diversity initiative. Love, So that's what great, we keep going. We it's awesome. Um, and I was hired as the first supplier diversity director. And Makes so much, love it. Unfortunately, we we're having the conversation in 2023 that we had back in 2025. 2015, you mean? I, I mean, the that we had back. That we had in 20, I mean, 2005. Oh, Got I'm it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries. I'm just trying to make sure I'm hearing you right. No, all right, keep going. And so the, the challenges we're having uh, are, are few. Developed um, a platform in 2016 in order to scale because hiring consultants, placing them on site, that's really an expensive business, yes. right? And so a lot of what we do are the analytics, the database management, you know, just the business. Is it a SaaS based business? Yes, it's okay. a SaaS based business. Fully funded. Amazing. And so, and we built it. We get feedback that it's an amazing platform. Since holding companies have now come in and centralized resources and are having a And since they own almost every single agency, bingo, bango. There you go. Makes sense. And our relationships were at the agency level, right? Can you create, and yeah, the, this is what sucks. The business needs to go into smaller, mm -hmm. right? Because the place you can get independence is 10 million in revenue and lower, right? right. Before the holding co buys it. The problem is those companies are so small that they're just trying to keep the lights on. They're not even thinking D, E, and I. You know, it's not that they're bad people. Right. It's just like, they're like, fuck, I'm not sure I'm gonna be business next year. And we're on the uh -huh. side. Right? Uh -huh. so you've got to have uh -huh. a client that really is requiring this in order for you to bring us in to do it. And so <coughs> my, my business manager is suggesting that we break up the, the two software. Mm -hmm. From the company. Well, we did that initially, but he, he's talking about breaking it out up into oh. smaller modules oh, okay. so that we can sell it at a lower price point. But I think to your point, because what I've, what I've experienced in this industry is that it's, it's just as difficult to sell $5,000 as it is to sell $50,000, yep. right? Yep, yep. Both theses are right. You know, I could tell you back to more Gary, consulting items as gateways to AORs, since I know I can talk to you in these terms, has worked for us. You know, because we had a very hardcore get out of bed fee to do what we do best. And we think, you know, and so I do think cost of entry is a variable. Mm -hmm. I equally agree with you that sometimes it's just as hard, same effort, to sell something for 5,000 as 5 million, let alone 50,000. That's real too. You know, I'm not against modulizing down. If you're asking one man's subjective point of view, I, what I like about it is it will give you more clarity. I always like eliminating things that you're debating for everyone. Like what I like about the modularity of like, how much is it now per month? 
per year? It's 180,000. Right, and he's saying, or she's saying, instead of 15K a month, let's have some sort of product that's 3K, and you can Voltron it up and discount it. Here's why I like it. My biggest concern is that there's six holding companies, they're full of shit, and there is no business to be had. Mm-hmm. What I like about dropping it from a 180 commitment to a 36K commitment, if you've got some module at 3K, mm-hmm. is you'll find out in a year if I'm right. Because that's a real low cost and that should be easy. And if you go 0 for 90 with a 3K thing, right. then you could say, wait a minute, I gotta really think about this shit and do I need to become like the Nintendo company? And that analogy for everyone is, they used to be a trading card, not a trading card, like a playing card company. Nintendo started as like blackjack cards and at some point they pivoted into technology. What I love is your expertise and your career and what you've got going, this goes into like really interesting debate that everyone should be thinking about. Always think about things that you have permission to do that you can't see. Like if, if you emailed me in nine months, which you're more than welcome to, and on a long flight I get to that level of email priority, and you're like, hey, thank you. This is not fun to write because I did break it down. I did go to market. And for the last seven, nine months, 15 months, we're not selling anything even at three. And it, you, you're right, it is full. My reply would be like, listen, now you need to think about should you be an author? Should you change it into a experiential company? Because maybe you shouldn't be selling it to tech or CIOs, maybe you should be selling to HR as a one day retreat to rethink things. Like, you could, like what's amazing is the talent you had as a kid in the SMS thing, that became the, co- that became the seeds of the same thing that you, we have our things. And sometimes you just gotta repackage it into a different item and remark, you know, containers and merchandising. Right, containers and merchandising, that's what we're all in. And, and so that, that's something worth debating. No, thank you. Cause the, cause the, you know what's great about, you know, when, when he said we're getting old 39, 40, I was laughing. Right, and I saw you snicker I like, I saw, I saw, <laughs> I saw. And I think, you know what's really cool? Like one big issue I have with the world that I'm excited to like, I finally am gonna eat my own dog food and do something I've been wanting to do which is I'm going to go and um, donate my time to retirement homes but I'm also gonna capture content. Because I realized as a young kid, even at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, I spent an ungodly amount of time with people that were 80 and 90 that weren't my grandparents. And for a long time I thought it was because I only had one grandma and one great grandma in my whole life because unfortunately everybody died in Russia pretty early. Um, But now I've come to realize, no, I've always just been attracted to macro thinking and wisdom and things of that nature. And right now I think we can all agree. By the way, 50 years ago in America, our grandparents were on a pedestal. Wisdom and experience was on a pedestal. Today we are all living where youth and technology is on a pedestal. 24 year olds are running around my company thinking they should be running this place. Right, that's the era we're in. Which means we're gonna go back. This is how the world works. So I'm excited about wisdom and experience gaining momentum in the next two decades. And I think your timing, like I just think it's important for you to hear that because I think when I hear that narrative and like first of this and this and that and it's a really important issue. Like it actually matters. And, I really and, do think this is a young person's game. And so. oh. Yes, but I, I think we're, yes, but I really do think that trading on wisdom and experience is about to gain momentum. I'm actually telling you that I think we're in the pre-dawn of it being your game. Okay. And I want to get that into your head. You. I really believe it. I'm not saying it to be nice. No, I, it's, I like to watch and I think we're about to get there. And I think it's early. I think, like, I think I'll probably clip this in like 11 years and be like, told you. <laughs> like it's gonna take a little bit of time but I think it's good for everyone to hear that, but for you specifically, where you are in your business life cycle, because I think you, I hope not, but I'm gonna be like very black and white on this, I think you should module, and I think you should sell aggressively against the modulization, because I think you need the answer, because I think you're in a precarious spot, because I think they're full of shit, and there's none of them, there's six of them. We don't need you, we got it, internally. We have a chief diversity officer, we're good. Yeah, you know. So, so. But the modulization, my hope is that it will work out. And that you now do have a 3K a month, a 7K a month, a 9K a month, and a 20K a month item. And oh, by the way, if you buy them all, it's a, only 15K a month. I think that's a worthwhile thing. I think it also will give you a year of that data to then go back to this back half of this conversation and say, okay, I might need to take what I am and repackage it into some other business and merchandise that. That's what I was thinking. Remember when you said to me, uh, 
Uber's a time management system. It just happens to be applied to logistics. Yeah. Maybe everything is correct. Easy, you know? Yeah. And you might actually even like the business you find yourself in more too. That's what's fun about entrepreneurship. Like sometimes you don't realize a tweak makes it more fun and more fruitful. And I, I, I love this when I got into it. It's just, it's been a long time. It's been a long journey. And markets change. And it has. I love when everyone's like, AI, I feel so bad for all the people that are gonna lose their job. I'm like, what about all the people that sold Yellow Pages? We didn't feel bad for them when search engines came. You know how many people were in the business of selling Yellow Pages? Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people were salesmen and women just of Yellow Pages in America when Yahoo and Ask Jeeves decided to come along. Like shit changes. Some poor dope bought 5,000 horses the day before the car decided to cause trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Those horses became less valuable. So I think that it's unfortunate because you should be shining. Well, and what we found is when when people are woke, if you will, our business doesn't do as well as we do when they're not. I know, I know. Yeah, I get it. The modulization. Awesome. Thank you. Scott? So before I turn it over to my wife, I just want to say, 20 year digital veteran, um, CFO at iVillage, <laughs> if you remember that name. Of course. One of the <clears throat> members of the founding team at 360i. Amazing. But all on the finance side. So it's okay, yeah. to be sitting in a meeting yeah, yeah. where I'm hearing operational yeah, yeah. activities. We're trying to figure out how to digitize market to our customer. Yes. So I just want to That's really cool. Your time. That's awesome, really of course. I do love that. So hi, I'm Laurie. I'm Laurie. the other half. Yes. Um, just Scott created these for me after I had breast cancer six I see. years ago. So we donate back to research. Um, love. We have a product. We've proven our our model. People people rebuy it. Stores buy it. Um, we're in the airports. We're in a hundred block brick and mortar stores. We're here to really. How do we expand yeah. on our D 2 C business? Um, Got it. So we we think that part of our issue is that our our content, our UGC. We don't think it's what it should be. And okay. Um, we came in today talking about that we don't really know who our target market is. We listened to a great section about cohorts earlier, yes. which was a hugely And hugely remember, for us. you know, we touched on the accordion nature of it. Did we touch on that? Uh, okay, cool. Let me back to cohorts. And I almost noticed how I knew that we probably didn't talk enough about it. The best part about cohorts is that it's a accordion. The number one thing that you have to understand about cohorts is that it's a living and breathing vessel. Back to day trading. So cool, like of course, an immediate cohort for this group is 18 to 22 year old coastal workout bros because it's fucking protein balls, like fuck, right? But after we do 16, 29 pieces of creative that we think we've done well enough, if we're seeing absolutely zero traction, it is okay for that cohort to go away. If we PCS properly and read everything, one, the most wild work I see is when we pick a cohort, we make for them, but the algo takes us in a different direction. We're like, wait a minute, this is actually for offensive linemen who fish and they pop them while they fish. So let's stand up, you know, tw- you know, 18 to 30 year old, 300 pound white boys who love country music and work out. And like, as you can imagine, that's gonna be different content. Right. right. So remember with cohorts, if you go down heavy, it's an accordion. Some expand, some contract based on the quant and the qual. The math and the feedback that you read from the PCS. The reason I'm onto stuff always is because I'm reading the qual. My wisdom thing is, again, not kindness for us four. Get in here, brother. Um, you know, it's for I'm smelling it. Like there's the tipping point. You can smell it. Like I had said j- earlier exactly that. Our, yeah. our customers are age two to 92. But we're Your customers are anyone with a fucking mouth. <laughs> right? 100%, yes, that's true, what you're saying. True, okay, true. keep going. So um, we do email marketing successfully. Okay. Um, we have a good conversion rate. Nice. So all they keep saying is get us more traffic, get more people to the site. So we have not done any paid ads yet. That's part of why okay. we're here. We want to learn no more worries. about yep. that. Makes sense. We haven't done paid ads or paid social. Okay. I mean, or paid um, search. What we okay. have done is paid a PR firm too much money to do brand building. Everyone does that. And now we're taking that money and we want to re- repurpose it into building our brand more. Um, we were told that you should have one face and that I should be making the content like like we were just talking about, um, which does sound like a big job, but it, you know, if we will test it because if that's what people want, then you know, I'll do it. Um, it's, people, like they taste the product, they like the product. 
Then they hear the story. Then they're more connected. Yeah, I mean the story is. Then they hear that we give back to research, and then it's we're done. Yeah, but, I mean the story is like so but off not, the we're charts. Not reaching enough people. One hundred percent. It may be our content. Um, it's de- it's every like I'm not reaching enough people, and it's my content. So what do you suggest? Make more content. Like every like there to me content like one day we will all wake up and actually live in mixed reality. Just I'll give you the preview. We will. We will live in mixed reality. The data is incredibly compelling. The technology is very clear. The new fucking Facebook Ray-Bans glasses, you've done it with the audio? The new one that just came out, right? It's, like, ear pods are in trouble. Like, like, you know, and that just like seems like, yes, like, so, and when everyone wakes up, every one of you is gonna regret not making more content for social media. Because it won't be where the attention is. And just like I regret not sending more emails in 98, not buying more Google AdWords in 2002, not like, so while we're in the era where this is the predominant engine of information, back to advertising, this is what happened when the radio and the television were switching. Literally, Budweiser is the biggest beer because Schlitz and Schaefer and Pabst Blue Ribbon blew it. They kept holding on to the radio and not realizing what the television was doing. It's insane if you look from 19, 50 to 1970, the switch of the biggest brands in every category from cigarettes to diapers. That's why Procter & Gamble's Procter & Gamble. They were the biggest spender on television. Do you know who the biggest spender on Google AdWords was in the first five years of AdWords? Amazon. There are moments where there is this thing, I spoke about it in the micro with him, TikTok versus like that. For you, it's just a macro. Back to why you considered hiring some people to get you a mention in a magazine. <laughs> Got it? Yeah, yeah. Or having you show up on the Today Show. You can be on the Today Show every day and you have no chance against somebody who knows how to make content for TikTok. That's, that's the refocus. So no, we, um, we've been, been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that means that's nothing. That's the issue. And we have, an, we have an edge. We're fresh from the fridge. Um, that, we're mm. not, that's what happened after I went through surgery and treatment. The nutritionist said no more protein bars. She said they sit on the shelf for a year. Of they course, have sugar, process. soy, preservatives. So I got it. We have an angle. We have an edge. Um, but we're not, we haven't been successful enough you know, yet. Um, How old is the brand? We, our website's only been um, there for a year and a half. And before that, you were selling in stores. Really, we're really pretty new. Yeah. Um, cool. We were dipping our toe in it. Best. Yep, but now you're ready to go all in. And you know, I have a friend and she said, get rid of everybody. Get rid of your whole payroll and, and just do AI. You know, <laughs> put your content out on AI, do your blogs on AI. Did you ask her how? She, I, she sent me an email. She said, <laughs> she said, I just made this email for you in under two minutes. Yes, I think I think there's a lot to that. I'm gonna go with like, that's not the, ex- I, I think her intent's yeah, in the right you, place. Bro. What's that? Go all in. Yeah, I think you gotta go all in on things that actually you work. People. You need a person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I'm about AI. I think the bigger issue is everyone here is at the mercy of the creative they put into the world. So, couple things. I think, first of all, now I'm gonna just kind of go like, not off script of the energy, but let me make pretend that Harwood invited us, me to dinner to have dinner with you. And we're like full dinner mode. The number one thing I would say for sure is that if I could convince the two of you over this dinner to do a daily or minimally a weekly podcast so it could be filmed for content, I do believe the story is off the charts. It's gonna pull at everyone. He's gonna be like the most loved man on earth. Like, you know what I mean? He's a good man. He looks like a good man. He's got a good face. Like, I feel the energy. Like, all of us need to do is find sustained ways to produce as much content as possible. And I think what I figured out years ago was I'm just gonna film everything. Obviously, then it's about can you introduce new people or different ideas? <laughs> like, your spidey senses based on your words are right. The variable of your success will be based on your advertising. Seems, makes sense. What's crazy about the world we live in now versus the Procter world or even when 360i was invented and Vayner was invented is now the Walmarts, right? The Wegmans, the dream places of distribution for you. What's that fucking place in LA? Air One. You know, like they now will come to you if you're good at content, right? It didn't work like that back in the day. So I think the biggest thing that you have to, your product is comes very natural to me in my mind. I think in these terms, I even said to these guys, like take your skills and bring them to this show. The prime, the beast chocolate, beast of, like that's the future. Like human base, like this is, you're the future. If you don't succeed in this, you will see someone that looks exactly like you two with the similar stories in 11 years and you're gonna look at each other and be, these motherfuckers, <laughs> you know, like it's very, very clear 
that you have to have a very compelling organic social media presence. What you have to figure out, that's easy. That's like, you could, you could have read that in a million places. How do you two, even if you two are not in it, though that would be my preference, but I'm, listen, as someone who's a public figure, a lot of shit comes with that. And it's not for everyone and it's not, right? Like it's not for everyone and like, and by the way, here's another thing real quick, good for you to hear as well. You can also come in and out. People think like it's an all or nothing thing. Sometimes you're a public figure, sometimes you're not. Some, you know, like it's okay. And you control your narrative, right? Like I keep my personal life very private. Right. So it's not like you have to tell them your pillow talk. You're in control. But I think what you have to do is put yourself in a position to make as much, like if I was your third partner, and this is what I did full time, we'd probably put out 55, 60 pieces of creative a day across seven platforms. We're doing that with some of our clients for sure. And there's like, and we can talk about it later, I don't want to hijack this, but there's like very cheap, simple software tools. That's what I was gonna say. How do we incorporate, like besides us making the content, how do we find we you guys? initial content library. Like you said, you can't skip that part. You gotta create all the content. But then getting it everywhere else, now that's where we're dipping our toes in. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah, with, and now with AI, it's even better than that. I yeah. built a team of people who had an eye for what to clip and when. AI's gonna do all that. Yeah, exactly. Like you're gonna upload the raw videos and it's gonna spit it out and distribute it for you. You software right now. Clap, K-L-A-P dot app. Yep. Yeah. There's another one called Get Munch. And we're gonna talk. Yeah, and, and by the way, I think all of you will, he, he can give you plenty that work yeah. for them. Here's even, and, and, and both are good. I like both those platforms. Let me give you something even more fun. There's a website called Google. Yeah. <laughs> and you type in AI software that helps you clip videos into good social media content. Enter. What will happen? You'll get two paid ads probably for so, weaker, pro, sometimes weak, sometimes not. All you have to do is actually just spend 10 hours which you would like this business to be successful. I have a funny feeling that you can allocate 10 hours to reading and watching video. How do you think we found them? You're just searching. It's just, you, you gotta put in the work to find that. But again, yes, that is efficiency. And efficiency matters. It's helpful for us to go from zero to one. Like if you haven't created content yet, like get the library going. Well, I wanna talk about what he's touching on and where I'm really worried. I'm worried, what always happens with software is people think it does it for you. The, when he says the video library, like he said it quick, and he's right because for him it's just sick in nature of like without that you have nothing. You on the receiving end is like, ooh, let me write down this site and I'm gonna use, that's gonna save me, that's gonna do it. It's not. The part that I'm saying is the well. That's the, the software is the sink. The well is do you all understand how to put yourself in a position to produce as much content as possible? No. The reason I like podcasts is because it puts you in a position to produce a lot of content. Also, when you have guests, now you can fucking prep for a podcast. So tell me about your childhood. Tell, tell, how did you, what was your first house? Like, you're an hour in if you just ask normal human questions, but then you have the clips. So I think, look, I think there's a lot of ways to think about it. There's other things. I don't know you two. Maybe you have a great 20, 30 person social crew and with a bunch of extroverts. You just might, I don't know you. But if you do, all of a sudden I see this, I'm like, okay, you need to throw at, I always think about two for ones. Like, I think for a lot of us, there's probably, yeah, I, th I assume all of us are kind of like similar in this, it's very universal. I don't think anyone spends as much time with friends as they actually wish they could. Like if you're right, it's just a universal thing, like everyone's busy, like to me, let's say you two are just like, just we're talking about that, that you just, aren't spending enough time with these four couples you love. My brain goes to, if we're lucky enough that you're thinking that, and we're lucky enough that those couples are extroverted or willing, willing to be filmed, now you can get together once a month, right? And have a protein balls and pairing with beverages. Literally actually have one human who's filming, friend, neighbor, youngest kid, or just set up a tripod, have dinner with eight of your friends, Literally, and this week, everyone bring a bottle of whiskey and we're gonna do whiskey with protein balls. We're gonna film and then you're gonna post-produce at the end be like, all right, 80% of it we can't share because the, the Johnsons were talking about how their daughter's a piece of shit. <laughs> and so that's, but 20% you can and now you're one TikTok away of people falling in love that like bullet bourbon and this go great together. And then the next month, 
Again, don't forget what you're doing. You're actually just spending time with friends, but you're getting double. You're getting doubles. Next time you're doing it with bottled waters, and next time with sodas, and the next time with clean beverages, and the next time with protein shakes, and the next time with fucking juice that's super pressed from organic fucking leaves from the Amazon. Like, I think for all of us, the big elephant in the room is do you understand yourself? Do you not bullshit yourself? Are you self-aware enough to know what puts me in the best position to film as much shit as possible so I can post-produce it? Because having a shoot day is already like a different version of content anyway and I'm not against it. You can supplement that with like one day when you do like 37 call to actions. You can have a shoot day. I think people are accustomed to that but I think the big one is can you put yourself in a position to create content? Content is your answer.